Welcome, everybody. Thank you uh, for coming to this uh, book discussion with Jim Shudo, the Chief National Security Correspondent of CNN, also the host of CNN Newsroom, the author of other books, including recently Shadow War, which kind of outlined the kind of various ways in which the United States is grappling with the rising power of China and, and, and Russia. Uh, previous to his work at CNN uh, and relevant to this discussion, uh, Jim had served as chief of staff in the U.S. Embassy in China uh, for then Am Ambassador Gary Locke, and also has reported from various uh, wars around uh, the Middle East uh, for many, many years. And his new book is Mammon Theory, uh, Trump Takes on the World. Um, I'm, I'm going to turn it over to Jim to kind of make some opening observations about the book and then we'll have a discussion and I'll, we'll open it up to your questions as well. So over to you, Jim. Thank you, Peter. Uh, you know, clearly the only book people in Washington are talking about right now. <laughs> uh, no, no, I, I do. Uh, first of all, thank you for the invitation and thanks to all of you for taking time out of this rainy uh, Washington day to discuss, to discuss this. Um, uh, just a little bit uh, about how I came to write this and, and what the big picture message is here. So, so what is the madman theory? Uh, students of history, all of us here, uh, even amateur ones like myself, will remember Nixon's madman theory, uh, which is a starting point for the book, where I talk about how President Nixon owned this theory, really. really. He, he, he believed it to be a powerful weapon for uh, the head of state. He, he very deliberately instructed his national security advisor, Henry Kissinger, to communicate to North Vietnam in the depths of the Vietnam War that he was just mad enough to nuke them, uh, to try to gain advantage in those, those negotiations to end the war. Uh, he did. Uh, there were White House discussions of those communications between Kissinger and Nixon, and, and Kissinger went to North Vietnam and, and delivered that threat. Um, it didn't work, right? We know how those negotiations worked out and how that war ended, but but Nixon, H.R. Haldeman, and his memoirs uh, proudly owned, owned it as a, as a useful uh, weapon, uh, based in part on Nixon's own misunderstanding, according to Tim Naftali, of, of how uh, and if Eisenhower used a similar threat to gain advantage in the Korean War. So 50 years later, we have a very different president who, in, in my theory, uh, has his own version of the madman theory. He's never articulated as, as such, but you've certainly heard him both as a private citizen and as a president uh, claim to know just what it's gonna take uh, to get either adversaries or allies to do what he wants. And th that includes perhaps an art of the deal version of this, right? Coming in at the end of negotiations with a uh, surprising concession or surprising demand, wielding a big stick in those uh, confrontations even with allies, whether it be steel tariffs, tariffs against Canada or threatening to withdraw troops from the Korean Peninsula against South Korea, or threatening and then, well, following through on withdrawing troops from Germany in the midst of uh, tense relationship with, with Germany. But also, of course, the way tariffs were used and continue to be used in the standoff with China. Um, what, what's different about Trump's madman theory in my view, is that he is just as likely to apply it to an ally as an adversary. And we saw in these continuing disputes with, with Mexico and Canada, with NATO, uh, with South Korea, uh, to our Syrian Kurdish allies in, in the war in Syria, as he was to apply them, say, to a China or to an Iran uh, or North Korea at the depths of that standoff in late 2017. Um, but add to his list of targets for this, this unpredictable uh, seat of the pants foreign policy uh, with a lot of threats thrown in a lot of different directions, his own staff. And, and that's the other thing that you hear recounted in this book by uh, many of his own senior advisors is that, is that this is a president who unleashed uh, his madman theory on his own advisors, his own cabinet secretary, surprising them with decisions and moves that not only were inconsistent, uh, with U.S. stated strategies, but his, his own administration's national defense strategy uh, and other stated plans. For instance, as I tell in the book, withdraw, dr withdrawing from Syria twice by tweet uh, and, other, uh, and other threats that he issued against the advice offered by his senior most advisors. So that's the difference about Trump's approach 
uh, to a, an unpredictable uh, threat-infused foreign policy is that he often uses it against our friends as well as our foes and, and keeps his staff and advisors just as off balance as he does adversaries. Of course, the one exception uh, to his madman theory in terms of adversaries, right? And I talk about this a lot in the book. Uh, one of the most consistent features of his foreign policy is is a consistent deference to Russia and and an unwillingness to threaten or call out even some of Russia's worst behavior, which we saw most recently with the poisoning of of Navalny. The president still has not called it out personally. And, and if you saw his answer last week to that question, uh, lots of diversion to others, but but no attention or answer to that, that essential question. Uh, that's the big picture theory. Uh, a couple other notes about the book before I go to Peter's incisive questioning uh, is that one, for the book, I spoke only to people who served this president at senior most levels. Um, I didn't go to a bunch of formers, although some are former Trump administration officials, but, but, but I focused on people who had firsthand experience of the president's decision-making and thinking uh, on this. And, and, and for that, uh, folks who you would put in the category of critics of his approach, say a Joseph Yan or even an H.R. McMaster, but others who you would still consider, and, and some still in the administration, like Peter Navarro uh, or Steve Bannon, very much defenders uh, of his approach. So that's one thing. I spoke only to them. And the other thing I try to do in this book in the final chapter is not to leave this just to you know, folks' opinions, but try to establish some hard measures, metrics to, to judge where Trump's madman theory has left us in each of these fields of play, North Korea, Russia, China, Iran, Syria, four years later, what he inherited uh, and what he has left in return. North Korea being one example, you had a year of fire and fury, three years of bromance, and North Korea has more, not fewer nuclear weapons. Uh, Iran is closer to, uh, not further from, the breakout point for a nuclear weapon. Russia is more not less aggressive in a whole host of fields of play, including election interference. So by those measures, you get a sense uh, uh, of, of what worked and what didn't work. Uh, so that's a big picture look at it. Uh, I appreciate you, you, you all taking the time and I, and I look forward to your, uh, to your hard questions. Yeah, one thing that's sort of striking about the book is something you allude to, Jim, which is, uh, you know, you have a lot of on the record, uh, clearly on the record, uh, um, discussion from Steve Bannon, from H.R. McMaster, from Sue Gordon, who was the number two at, uh, for Dan Coates, uh, Joseph Yun, you mentioned Young, Peter Navarro, Fiona Hill, um, Mick Mulroy, who is a character that I'd not really ever actually heard of. So um, usually the, these kinds of books rely on people not going on the record. So uh, to walk us through the process a bit, also you're a busy guy with a busy day job and three kids and <laughs> wife and uh, you know, you've got a lot going on in your life. So how did you, and you also wrote a, another book relatively recently. So how did you do the book and what was the process and uh, what led you to get these folks um, to, to speak on the record? Well, first on, on the sources. So what I found is that many folks who serve in this administration want to speak on the record. And, and, and obviously it's easier to take swipes uh, from behind anonymous sources. And, I, and, and I'm one person who doesn't find anonymous sources uh, by, you know, by definition to be a bad thing because there are certain things that folks can't speak about, right? Uh, and it may, when you're able to speak to multiple people, give you a vision of something. But, but on this one, I, I, I lean strongly in favor of on the record sources just so that folks were backing up their point of view. And, and I found that, um, people consider this moment in time serious enough uh, and this administration's approach different enough uh, and in the view of some dangerous enough, right, th that they're willing to put a name to it. So, so that was one phenomenon which I think is, is, is notable, right? And we're seeing more of, more of that as we get closer to, to the election, uh, even in that other guy's book uh, that just came <laughs> out. Um, the, uh, so, so that was a, a process. Just a, a brief note about Mick Mulroy, uh, just to, as to, to who he is. So he, he, was, he ended up being a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Defense Department under Mattis, his guy for the Mideast. So oversight of Syria, Iran, other issues there, you know, front row seat uh, to some of these most consequential decisions, particularly during the Iran and Syria standoffs. And, and I had interactions with him going back to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 when he was, um, so he had the advantage not only of being a DOD guy, but, but he was CIA and former Marine. So 
had firsthand experience, you know, he was on the battlefield with the Kurdish forces, you know, against ISIS and, and prior, we actually ended up being embedded, him as a CIA op and me as a plain old journalist with the same Green Beret uh, unit that went into Northern Iraq uh, during the invasion and then allied with the, the Kurdish Peshmerga forces there. So long history there overlapping, just a quick note on him. How did I write this book? I mean, listen, I, after the Shadow War came out, sort of that was May last year, later that summer, my editor at Harper said, hey, listen, you know, I, no one's yet really written a broad overview of Trump's foreign policy, America first and what it means and how it played out would you want to do that? And I said, absolutely. And they said, problem is I need it before the election. So that means I need the manuscript by like January. Um, and uh, first thing I did is I asked my wife. <laughs> and thankfully, like you, Peter, I have a patient wife and um, like, like me felt, and she's also a journalist, like me felt this is an important project. So just squeezed out the time. And, and uh, it also helped that people were willing to speak to me on the record. And, and when, with those kinds of accounts, it just made it e easier to, uh, to get it out, but it, it, it was, uh, it, took, it took a lot of hard deadlines, right? Like this month, 15,000 words a month, something along that kind of, that kind of pace. And uh, now I'm gonna take a break for a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> you deserve one. You know, well, I'm, you know, I read the book uh, and, uh, and found it very interesting. And I, I think it is an attempt to be uh, as fair as possible with, with somebody who elicits uh, a lot of, uh, you know, strong emotion but I, as I read your kind of, uh, the kind of final reckoning at the end, it seemed to me that overall, and you alluded a little bit already, but like if we had to march through the big issues, Iran, Russia, China, North Korea, Middle East, you know, I, 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 don't, I didn't take away from your conclusion that there was much advancement on any of these fronts and, 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 and probably some uh, quite the reverse, although you're, you know, you, you certainly credit him on ISIS and so let, let's start, let, it's, the negative case I think is pretty easy to make on some levels. Mm -hmm. What's the positive case? So as, as you know, I spent a lot of time in China going back 25 years and, and yeah. I've been someone who, who, who's thought, you know, standing up to ch Chinese malign activities in a whole host of spheres, including the trade sphere, um, was long overdue. And I wrote about that some in the shadow war. So, so the simple act of standing up definitively um, and challenging a lot of these behaviors, I think, you know, deserves praise, right? So then the question becomes, what have you accomplished with that? I mean, where we find ourselves is actually, and it, you know, the, the final word on this remains to be written because we're in the midst of an escalating standoff with China with no clear end game. And this is another criticism of Trump's madman theory, right? Is that and by, by the accounts of his own advisors, rarely if ever connected to a broader strategy, very seat of the pants, no hard measures about what I'm seeking in this particular moment in time, except, you know, with the China standoff now, just to stand up to them more and more and more and, and pump it up as you get closer to an election, which has a whole host of dangers, right? Um, in terms of, you know, because they've got ways to escalate too, which they are doing. And, and if you look at it in hard measures, yes, they've been stood up to, have their trade practices improved, not clearly, by the way, they've nabbed Hong Kong in the midst of this, right? I mean, violated a, an agreement with the British, and, and that's a sad, I lived in Hong Kong for five years, that's a sad event, and there's a lot of nervousness about Taiwan. I'm sure you hear that from your own context. So, you know, China, the stand-up, yes, uh, the end result of that, we're not clear where that's going to lead us, you know, and on the other things, as you mentioned, it's just not easy to cite the positive progress. I mean, UAE, Israel, peace is good news, for sure. Um, yeah, where, well, that, does bring, where does it bring Israel, Palestine? Another issue. Yeah, but it's okay. Well, let's let's. I mean, obviously, that happened after you finished your book. Um, but how would you score that in the kind of grand schemes and scheme of things, where you have you know Egypt, Israel, peace, Jimmy Carter, um, you know Oslo, which didn't really. I mean, how does it? It's not insignificant, surely, right? Yeah. But on the other hand, it's not transformative. It depends on what you consider the primary. Uh, crisis in the Middle East, right? You know, Jimmy Carter, Anwar Sadat, and that, that was to, to head off another war between Egypt and, and Israel. Um, this one, uh, not clear what war heads off, but, um, you know, maybe it leads to better relations with the Gulf states who've kind of thrown their lot in. Uh, it's, it's, it's been an adjustment, right? I mean, 
by the way, who gets lost in all of this? If you care fundamentally about fairness for the, for the Palestinian people, that has moved not forward at all, it's moved backward, right? It's moved backward during this time period and you know, open talk at the end of the two-state solution, which of course pre predated Trump, but I mean, you could say has, has been further ingrained. Um, so it's a step. I, you know, I'd have to peer bigger cases as to, as to how it dramatically changes the dynamic in that region. Although it, it might presage just a different, right, like a realignment that we've talked about a little bit, you know, Gulf states with Israel and, you know, all this talk about, you know, Arab unity with, with the Palestinians uh, not panning out. So um, you give Trump his, well, actually, let me, let me back up to something you talk about strategy, because I think, uh, so I think you quote Mick Mulroy in the book um, saying it wasn't clear that Trump had actually read the yeah. national defense strategy or the national security strategy. I mean, I, I think it's an open and shut case that he didn't. Yeah. These documents are quite long. Um, and and we, when I talk about in the book about how he, he did not read his, his intelligence briefing material. And I tell the story about how H.R. McMaster and his team, uh, it, knowing that, boiled down his security briefings to three bullet points on a note card. Um, and then they discovered he was not reading all three bullet points on a note card. So they try to concentrate all the relevant information into two of three bullet points. And third one became sort of a throwaway line. And then they came to realize he wasn't even reading those. Uh, so he's, you know, that's a pretty consistent telling of, of how this president processes information. So he almost certainly didn't read these big documents, but yeah. on the on the China uh, question, you know, when historians write the history of the of the Trump administration, would you conclude that you know, uh, kind of in the big picture, he, he got it right, even if on the tactics around trade that you know that it was kind of um, the the tactics themselves mm -hmm. may not have been that smart. Um, and leaving aside the whole COVID question for a minute, depends on what your goal is, right? If your goal, and, and folks like Peter Navarro speak openly about this, if your goal is decoupling and chasing the supply chain out of supply chain out of China, uh, if that's your goal, um, then he set us on that path, right? Um, there are a whole host of dangers that come with us, right? It's funny when I was in China with Ambassador Locke, I remember sort of in every speech there was a line about how you know, the U.S. and China have, I forget, the, it was either a thousand times or 10,000 times, that, but an order of magnitude bigger, uh, the trade that the U.S. and the Soviet Union had. And that, that, that was a way to kind of keep you tied in a way that you have mutual interests. As, as that disappears, then these other issues that, that pull you apart become easier to pull you apart, you know. Um, is America, is the world ready for that, you know, a decoupled relationship that is purely adversarial, that has a whole host of consequences and dangers, right, then starts making you think Thucydides trap, right, you know, that you're headed down that path. So it depends on what you go on. The, the thing is, it's not clear that the president has a goal, right, or a way, you know, his, he, he imagines in all these interactions that he can dial it back and forth at his whim and just perfectly get it to kind of go in his direction or, or you know, pull us back from the precipice just in time. I mean, the North Korea thing is interesting, and this is some, a place where Woodward and my accounts line up. I mean, I talk about in my book how in the depths of the North Korea standoff in, in late 2017, his own senior military officials were withholding military options from the president because they were concerned he was going to take us to war. Woodward talks about Mattis, you know, going to the National Cathedral to say prayers and sleeping in his uniform because he was worried about that very prospect. And yeah, dialed it back just in time, you know, did he have a good sense of, you know, was it brilliant calculation or luck that kept us from going to war at that point? That's the, that's an open question. Well, some of his instincts are, um, you know, when we say dial it back, are you talking about North Korea or, or, or Iran? Well, I was talking about North Korea there too, but also, you know, also you can make the same pattern for Iran, you know, after post Qasem Soleimani. And we've had the announcement in the last 24 hours of reduction of troops in Iraq to 3,000 and reduction, uh, I think, to like uh, 4,500 in Afghanistan. So, I mean, to, in many ways, this is very similar to the Obama-Biden team, right? A pullout from Iraq uh, at the end of 2011, uh, much discussion in, in the Obama team about pulling out of Afghanistan. In the end, it didn't happen, but there was certainly a desire to go to zero. So 
you know, one of the unexpected, well, perhaps unexpected for their supporters uh, or their critics is the similarities between Obama and Trump mm. on this yeah. issue. Yeah. Yeah. People forget it. Right. I mean, you know, and Trump has a number in mind. Right. I mean, he, he wanted to be below Obama's numbers at election time. And that's what we're seeing. Right. I mean, this is the thing about Trump. Always, almost always transparent on this kind of stuff. Um, what's troubling about that, right, is that, you know, Trump and Republicans excoriated Obama for pulling out of Iraq so quickly, and, and rightfully so, right? Because you, you could draw a straight line between that and the, and the resurgence of ISIS, um, the rise of ISIS, you know, for the political calendar, again, risking the same thing. By the way, I don't, I don't know how you, 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 you and your wife know Afghanistan far better than me, but when you look at, you know, the outlines of the peace deal you know, this administration was willing to take in Afghanistan. I mean, it's, does that leave it safe? Does that protect your ally there? Does it, does it leave it safer? You know, again, looking at this end, you know, the clear priority keeping to this end, the endless wars campaign promise, regardless of the consequences, you know, seemingly on the ground. Well, on Afghanistan, he seems to have, um, there seems to be almost two policies. Uh, one is the kind of uh, Zal Khalazad, let's do mm -hmm. a deal and get out, uh, which, and then there's the kind of, uh, you know, uh, CIA DOD thing, which is we need to retain some kind of counterterrorism policy. Seems that Trump has gone back and forth between those um, without coming, getting back to your larger point about strategy. It's like, it, it's hard to sometimes discern what, what the strategy is. Yeah. Let me let me turn to a couple of um, questions that have come in. One is about uh, Bob Woodward's book, and it's from uh, Dr. Mia Bloom, who's a New America fellow and an expert on counterterrorism. And, and she's asking kind of the hypothetical question because uh, Woodward is getting some criticism for kind of withholding the information he had um, early on about the disconnect between the president's public statements about the coronavirus and what he was saying privately. Uh, is that a legitimate critique or? Um, well, listen, I, first of all, the, the, the primary, we're not even 24 hours, right? And I feel like the primary discussion is the commander in chief here, right? I mean, it's, uh, he knew it and, and his public statements belied that, right? Not, not just public statements, but also decision, decision making on it. And to this day, as I was talking about on our show this morning, the president's still downplaying the outbreak, right? It was a week ago he shared this conspiracy theory about the death toll being overrated. I mean, you know, so being being uh, massively, you know, overstated. So he's still playing that game. And I think, you know, that from my perspective is a far bigger thing. I mean, listen, what, I suppose you could make that argument. I mean, is it on the scale of public servants who know this stuff still not coming out? I don't think so. I think that's a legitimate discussion. Um, I mean, listen, Woodward wasn't called to testify in an impeachment inquiry, right? You know, do I put it in the same category as Bolton? You know, I don't. It's, uh, I mean, what, you know, it's, I guess it's a, it's a sort of, a, it's almost a university debate, right? Because what is the, if you're a journalist and you're reporting out a story and it's a big picture story, right? You're trying to connect all the dots and you get a, you get a line of information here that's part of that bigger fabric do you put that line of information out before you have the, the, the other bigger fabric? I don't know. I think it's a debate. How do you come down on that? I'm curious. Well, look, at the end of the day, commander in chief is a commander in chief. Bob Woodward has no ability to actually operationalize any responses. Uh, so, yeah. I mean, but I, you know, just to go back to your book here on, because there's some, I think you wrote, a, um, there was some news that kind of came out and you, which you reacted to on CNN, CNN.com before your book was published, yeah. reading around kind of very interesting thing that the book does discuss in some detail, yeah. which is the way in which the intelligence community would um, deal with the fact that Trump really didn't want to hear anything about Russia. So tell, yeah. tell the audience a little bit about, about that. Yeah, there was. And I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. I almost forgot. But like a month or two, even before the book came out, what was happening then? Uh, it was, re it was, it was, it was I think it was the whole question of the Russian bounty thing. And yes, it was Russian bounties and whether the president had been briefed about the Russian bounties. And I called up my boss and I said, listen, you know, as I watch the story, it's very familiar to something I was told from my book called Jeff Zucker 
my boss and I said, I think we should report this now. So you're right. I mean, I, I, jumped, I jumped the gun on the book because I thought that the reporting was relevant to, to the discussion at the time. Um, and that particular story was this, and that is that Trump's intelligence briefers at the highest level very early on discovered that the president blew up their description when they brought up any intelligence about Russia, any sort of Russia threat, whatever it was, election interference, messing around in Ukraine, just blew up, didn't want to hear it, attacked them, said, what do they really know? It was clearly a sensitive point to him. And their reaction over time was to brief him less on Russia threats. Sounds crazy. The way, and I pressed them, I said, are you kidding me? You brief them less on threats? Just, be, you know, what's your job? And they said, well, listen, we have to maintain this conduit of information with the commander in chief. So we really had to pick our battles here and brief him when it was a sort of 10 level threat as opposed to a three level threat, you know, so that you weren't kind of burning, you know, your ammunition or whatever the, you know, the metaphor is mm -hmm. there. That was their explanation for it. And it struck me as, first of all, in light of the broader, his broader approach to and, and attitude towards Russia, but in light of that. So yeah, I guess, I guess journalists sometimes do. <laughs> I almost <laughs> forgot that, Peter Bergen. So I'm right, he's wrong, <laughs> buy my book. <laughs> um, a question from Faribor's Fat Fatimi. So what did the Mammon theory achieve with Iran, except they make everything more dangerous in this, yeah. arena, this area? And the UAE relations had been going on for decades and that kind of changes nothing. I guess the UAE and Israel had had this sort of below the table kind of relationship. Um, the Obama-Biden administration, you know, Iran's most important, so they worked hard to make an opening with this nuclear agreement. Listen, the, the Iran policy is a failure on that front. By the, by yeah. the definition, the, go the goal of the president was to get a better deal. He doesn't have a better deal. He has no deal. And therefore, yeah. the security situation is weaker, and, and they are closer to a nuclear bomb. They have, what, 10 times? I mean, Pompeo tweeted it the other day. They have 10 times the highly enriched uranium limit uh, that they had under the agreement, which U.S. intelligence assessed Iran was abiding by. Okay. Uh, but just, just, just to clarify, Jim, so, so I, my understanding is they, it was like 4% that they could enrich, and they've gone up to 5% or more. But what, I mean, what, what, what was Pompeo getting at? I mean, well... Pompeo is getting at that now they are violating the treaty. Right. Okay. But they're violating in a way that, I mean, like 90% is what you need for the, for the bomb. Right? No, so they're they, not, they're not, they haven't gotten to a bomb. Right. But, but they have passed the limits contained in that agreement and therefore closer to, they're closer to breakout than they, than they would have been. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so it's, you know, if your goal was to get a better agreement, you haven't gotten it, right? And, and if your goal was to make Iran further away from a nuclear weapon than closer, you've done the opposite, right? They're, they're closer to a nuclear weapon. I mean, their central argument going into this was um, the Obama agreement didn't cover enough and for long enough, right? That's a fair, you know, that, that's, a, that's, an argue, that's a debatable criticism, a fair criticism, you could say. Um, but the agreement was always just nukes and not other military aggression, ballistic missiles in, in the region. That's what the agreement set out. So fine to make that criticism, then, then what do you replace it with? Do you successfully rally your allies and China and Russia and Iran and pressure them successfully to sit down and negotiate a broader, more re restrictive agreement? They didn't do that. In fact, you, you, China and Russia never appeared interested, and now you have your own ally. You're, you're, you're at loggerheads with your own allies on enforcement of snapback sanctions. So I mean, remember er, early on in, um, you know, this, you know, by their, so by their own standards, um, they have failed on the Iran policy. And then, the, the, I, I recount this too, you, Esper started an Iran strategy group. Oh yeah, well, that, by the way, that's the first time I'd heard about it, that, so tell us. Yeah, it's, uh, I was hoping that would make more news, but, but Esper started an Iran strategy group to assess the success or failure of the Trump administration strategy by these measures. Um, and their conclusion was that it had failed. It, tactically, it succeeded. It had caused Iran more economic pain, but strategically it had failed because Iran is closer, not further from a nuclear weapon. Iran is no less aggressive in its ballistic missile program and is arguably more aggressive in other kind of military activities around the region. So 
by those standards, it's failed. And, and Mick Mulroy makes the point, who was involved in this Iran strategy group, uh, that you've also made it very difficult to negotiate the next agreement, whether it be with Iran or North Korea, because the last agreement your country negotiated, you pulled out of summar summarily. So what's your, what's your credibility to stick in the next one? Well, that goes to the, my next question, which is, if let, let's say there is a Biden administration, obviously somebody, Tony Blinken and others that were involved in the Iran deal under Obama would presumably have pretty large and important roles in a, in a future Biden administration. If they try and resuscitate the deal, I mean, presumably Iranian moderates already, moderates, quote unquote, already had to make quite a lot of concessions to the hardliners to get in the deal in the first place. Is there a universe yeah. in which the Iranians would even take a deal unless they had a guarantee of Senate ratification, which the last deal did not have? Yeah. Well, no, I mean, they, uh, they have their own domestic politics, right? And uh, how do you win over the skeptics and, and kind of like, you know, shift the balance between the hardliners and the, you know, the quote unquote moderates there? I don't know. I don't know. And what's the credibility? I mean, it, it raises a broader question about our pendulum swing politics in this country and how it affects broader national security issues. Because yeah. just as we have a pendulum swing on domestic policy, you know, Portable Care Act, knock it all down, right? You know, tax policy, not, you know, knock it all down. You, you have it arguably on, on what were kind of large, you know, bipartisan issues in the international space. You know, Russia's a bad guy. You know, and we're going to stand up to them. Uh, the Iran nuclear deal. So, so, you know, are, are our deals or alliances, do they only have four-year timelines? It's kind of an alarming thing to think about. I mean, NATO, and it's not me, it's Bolton, right, saying that NATO's 70-year-old alliance, you know, might be gone in 56 days, you know? <laughs> and if, and if, if Biden wins, how confident are Germany and, and others, and by the way, how deterred is Russia that that lifeline for NATO has any more than four years, you know, given the current back and forth. Yeah. We have a, your book does not address this. So I, I, you know, if you don't want to address it, we have a question about Cuba, um, basically kind of, you know, obviously the, one of the changes was, you know, kind of essentially closing that door again with Cuba. Any thoughts on that or? Well, I did see the question because I saw w whether it was carrying water for Putin. I, I tend to think that Cuba is more personal for Trump, that Trump and his own advisors say this, that that is so driven by personal animus for Barack Obama that anything that he built up, he wants to take down. Yeah. That's true on Obama. And, and it's not to say that's the only reason, right? Because he has other policy disagreements with him, but, but on Obamacare, one, on the Iran nuclear deal, I mean, even, well, even there is a small the Nobel there is. Peace Prize. And there's also the small matter of the state of Florida. Yes, well, there is, for sure. <laughs> uh, no question, absolutely. And that's why, remember, look at Venezuela, right? I mean, there, there's some Venezuelans yeah. in Florida. The president's, and I talk about this in the book, his like six-month attention span for Venezuela had political aspirations a, a, attached to it. And, and it's a great story, Venezuela, there, about how the president really believed he could just flip Venezuela in that moment. For, for a moment, Guaido could do it, and he seemed to be convinced by... Some, some of his advisors that it was doable and the president was lightly throwing out the prospect of US military intervention, though it was never really serious. And then when it became clear Maduro was strong, moved on to the next thing. We don't hear about that anymore. Guaido showed up at the State of the Union, but not as a serious contender to take over leadership there, more as a kind of like token, uh, you know, uh, with a political Benjamin. Yes, we were, we were talking about the positives. Clearly, Venezuela was in the kind of negative column, but at least from their point of view, because they didn't, Maduro was still in power. But um, so China, yes, big positive. UAE, Israel, you know, kind of interesting development. ISIS defeat geographically. Um, what else would you put in the positive column? Um. Well, he will put in there that we didn't go to war with North Korea, but th that's one of those classic examples of ramping it up to, you know, he ramps it up to here. And granted, it was, it's not like, God knows, it was not hunky-dory when he came into office, but in terms of the real precipice was late 2017. And again, like, as I say, recount in the book, his own advisors were concerned the president was tipping us over the precipice to war. So he dials back 
with diplomacy after that. Um, and again, uh, imagines that purely his personal relationship will fundamentally change North Korea's motivations there, which, which hasn't been the case. Um, so, uh, you know, that's a, it's not so much a victory as, as drawing yourself back from a, from a grave mistake or escalation of, of that conflict. Um, I, I'm open to suggestions for other successes in the international sphere. I don't see them. I mean, I talk in, in the epilogue about the pandemic as a, another encastle, encapsulation and crystallization of his America first approach. And on that, um, you know, a, a failure. And you, and you see, you see um, so many elements of his way of doing things under his madman theory play out in the coronavirus pandemic. And I kind of lay it out in the, in, the, in the epilogue. Minimize the crisis. I got this. It's not as big a deal as you think. Politicize it. Anybody who doesn't agree with my approach is a, is a never Trumper, Democrat, Marxist, whatever, uh, and politicize even the facts, right, and the numbers, which he's still doing. Demonize the experts. You've heard his attacks on Fauci and others, and, and rarely strategize, right? That it's sort of like, hey, what suits me in the moment, you know, diverted to the states, you know, that kind of thing. And we're, you know, we're paying the effects of that right now. Yeah, I thought that was a particularly strong section of the book where you kind of uh, unpack this kind of. Uh, set of ways it usually deals with big problems, you know, hyper-personalization, politicization. Yeah, personalized. Forgot that one. All yeah. the experts. I mean, it's a very good kind of laundry list. We have a question from Doug Ollivant, who was the former NSC director for Iraq under George W. Bush, and also spent a lot of time in Afghanistan, and also, also as a New America fellow. And Hi, Doug. How's it going? <laughs> <laughs> Doug asks, doesn't this administration feature, quote, two policies on almost every foreign policy issue? Uh, uh, Peter Bergen talked about Afghanistan, but on China, we have an emerging decoupling competing against the more traditional Mnuchin view on Russia. We have Fiona Hill versus more forgiving on Iraq, a policy with a, with a post-2003 policy versus the policy that sees Iraq as part of Iran policy on NATO, President versus the Pentagon. Is there any foreign policy on which this administration speaks unequivocally? Yeah. No, really. I mean, and I'm, I'm with you, Doug. It's, it's, it's exactly that. I mean, you have, I mean, McMaster talks about this a lot in the book. He's like, we did all the meetings, we had the national defense strategies, we had the plans, etc. But Trump would upend them, right? And, you know, which one really matters, right? Is it the one, is it the written one? Or is it the one as it plays out? I mean, when you look at a Russia, for instance, does Russia, is Russia deterred by a statement from the National Security Council spokesperson on Navalny, <laughs> which is all you got, right? <laughs> or the president saying something definitive about it, right? I mean, the NSC spokesperson in a tweet, you know, followed, you know, our, you know, U.S. principles and history and all that kind of stuff, but the president not. So how does, what does Russia say? They say, well, we could probably get away with the next one, you know? Um, you know, on, uh, you know, Canada, there's a section in Canada on the book, and I, this made a lot of news in Canada about a week and a half ago, uh, Navarro dismissing the U.S. alliance with Canada. And it's, it's just a remarkable back and forth. I would really ask you to read it because I was, you know, dumbfounded as, as I'm listening to him, because you know, I said, listen, you're, you know, you're applying the same cudgel to Canada that you are to China uh, on trade and so on. And, and, and I, and he said, yeah, well, you know, they, they didn't treat us well on trade. And I was like, well, Okay, you have, dis you have disagreements over steel and, and dairy, but I mean, Canada is an ally. He's like, are they really? I said, yeah. I mean, uh, Normandy to <laughs> Afghanistan, you know, they're an ally. He's like, really? Do they really fight those wars to, to help us or themselves? I was like, well, they bled a lot on those battlefields. I mean, there are, you know, they invoked the NATO charter after 9 11. Read the exchange because it was immovable on that, right? So you can hear, and in the wake of that, you had US. Ambassador to Canada released statements, all that kind of stuff. But who's Canada listen to? They listen to that guy or Trump and Navarro, right? It's uh, now you do have areas where, where those policies come into conflict, right? I mean, like today, you see Dare Cash, uh, you know, Treasury Department is sanctioning him as a known Russian intelligence agent. Meanwhile, Giuliani was meeting with him, getting dirt on Biden, and by the way, so was Ron Johnson until just like a few days ago. You know, so you have. You know, what rules a day? I don't know. I mean, I know that Putin, I mean, I, I ask folks in Intel all the time, how does Putin interpret this on all these levels? Um, or even the president's failure or refusal to warn Russia away from interfering in this election. 
even if you get a statement from, I don't know, someone else, uh, who does Putin listen? He listens to Trump. So which one of those wins out when you have these conflicts? And, and here's the other thing is when you talk to these guys in the book, and I'm sure you've heard similarly, in a second term, a lot of things that were half measures in the first term, they expect to become full measures in a second term, including, you know, up and leaving something like NATO. Wow. Um, that answers the question. <laughs> uh, question from Chris Fussell, also New America fellow, president of the McChrystal Group, uh, former commander in the SEAL teams. Um, Jim, what's your sense of how the administration has impacted our view of truth? Mm -hmm. You sense that Trump has undermined the concept of truth in a deliberate and intentional manner, or is he naturally unconcerned with provable facts and solely focused on outcomes, which allows him to manipulate the concept of truth at a much more strategic level, including our adversaries than Trump would ever have intended? Yeah. Um, hi, Chris, by the way. Thank you for the question. Um, I think extremely deleterious. And one of the most, you know, demoralizing developments of the day. It didn't start entirely with Trump, but it certainly accelerated. We don't, we don't have an accepted truth right now, you know. And I know there are different ways of looking at a whole host of things, right? Be a party or news outlet looking at, I don't know, healthcare policy. Who's responsible for the severity of the coronavirus outbreak, et cetera. But there shouldn't be two ways of looking at essential facts, right? How many dead people there are, right? Um, is Durkash a Russian agent, you know? But there's, there, are, there are, even on base, and, and is it right to take information from someone like that? Does that count as foreign election interference? You know, it's interesting, the Trump approach is very Soviet in that sense. And, this is what the Intel folks tell me in that, you know, their strategy through the years is not always to convince you, right, but just to muddy the waters. Raise a question. Well, do we really know, you know, both sides? I mean, how often do you see that? Well, two ways of looking, you know, whatever, even on stuff that either is a f element of fact, you know, it's raining today, you know, these people died from coronavirus, or something that used to be a generally agreed upon truth. Russia is a bad actor in the European space, right? It is, I don't know how we dial back from that. It's, it's interesting. I, I uh, you know, I was watching when the Woodward stuff came out uh, and actually the, this Atlantic piece, and I know the Atlantic piece is, you know, probably more of an opening there because it was anonymous sources, but the Woodward, the, the Woodward stuff, here, here's the president's voice saying, I downplay it, right? Even as you play the tape, three seconds later of him saying, you know, you know, acknowledging that he knew how bad it was and then saying, you know, it's, it's no big deal. And, and I switched back and forth between the various competing networks and I looked at some, you know, Twitter feeds and so on. Night and day, Venus and Mars, I mean, two totally different views of it. That's where we are, man. I don't know what pulls us back from that. You know, one, uh, in Trump's defense, um, we may not be able to point to like a ton of successes. Chip Pitts has chimed in to say USMCA is a Trump success. I don't know what your take on that is, but I think the general view is there is a huge difference between that and, and NAFTA. You know, it's kind of like sort of a, I, I presume that's a reference to the Mexico-Canada trade agreement. Um, but I mean, one thing that Trump has not done um, has, is to make some sort of huge foreign policy mistake like the Iraq war 2003 um, or maybe I mean you know his response to coronavirus may be a version of that in the sense of sort of it's not really foreign policy it kind of national national more our own national security but he hasn't made a major unforced error uh, overseas shall we say um, uh, of the of the let's say of the scale of the Iraq war or even Lyndon Johnson sort of prolonging the Vietnam war so is that kind of a form of success in some way? Well, it's interesting. I, I make the comparison in the book that there is some overlap between the Obama don't do dumb, stupid shit, yeah. you know, or stupid stuff as yeah. it was cleaned up to. Yeah. And Trump, in, in this sense, in that the grand ambitions, right, if you think 2003 invasion, rewriting the map of the Middle East, uh, starting a tide of democracy or other, you know, grand American missions, I don't know, you know, 
Vietnam War, right? Um, that the two of them share a limited, realistic, if you want to call it that, or just unambitious view of America's kind of uh, change the world sort of role. Now, overlap, I'm not saying equivalency, right? Because, because Trump, Trump is a, from his point of view, he views the world end of American exceptionalism, right? There is nothing special about America in the world. And it, he, he, he shares, and, and Fiona Hill talks about this in the book, because I, I asked everybody about, explain his fascination with Russia and Putin, and beyond some suspicions, which I did not report because I wanted to just talk about what people knew or experienced. Um, you know, the best answer they could come up with is that he shares a nihilistic view of the world of Putin. Zero sum game, everybody's a dirty player in a dirty game. Allies and adversaries, they're all seeking to take advantage. In an odd way, he looks at allies more skeptically than adversaries, because you expect your adversary to screw with you. The allies, we've been bankrolling in his view for years, they've been free loading off of us, so they owe us more. So he's more skeptical and almost hostile to them. So he does, you know, he takes, you know, a limited ambition for the U.S. role in the world to a, we're no different, you know, we're the same. And you saw that in his comments to Bill O'Reilly, right, going back to, well, Putin's a killer. Yeah, are we that much better? Or even more recently with these bounties and, and uh, Russian arms sales to the Taliban, the president saying, well, we sold arms to the Taliban in the 80s. You know, it's all the same. There's no, there's no real difference uh, in these uh, players. So, um, Yes, it, 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 it did not start a uh, horrible war in the Middle East, right? He did not like the, uh, what's the line from A Princess Bride? You know, the, the first rule is never get involved in a land war in Asia, right? The second is, uh, so he didn't, he didn't do that. Uh, I would say, though, that we shouldn't, uh, like, on, you know, that, that not responding to the pandemic in a coordinated national way with all the recommendations that are pretty simple and, and consistent about testing and screening and, and so on would not only have saved lives, but obviously, you know, probably limited economic damage to some degree. So I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't downplay that as a, as a major national security mistake, but yeah, not, we didn't go to war yet. Question from Alexander Stark, who's also at New America and uh, is sort of an expert on the question of proxy warfare in the Middle East. Uh, she says she's curious about the madman theory framing when it, when it, Thomas Schelling's version of this is a deliberate tactic used by an otherwise sane leader. Mm -hmm. But it doesn't seem like that Trump is doing any of this deliberately as much as, like you said, following his instincts. To what extent does the administration deliberately use Trump's indecisiveness as a tactic to their advantage versus, versus are they simply reacting to and trying to dial down his random statements and tweets? Yeah. No, listen, I, I mean, I, I, when I'm describing, it, I say he's madman by accident, right? You know, the, the, it's a, it's a, it's a uh, execution of the madman theory by accident because he is just unpredictable. He makes his decisions in the moment and it's not part of a, of a grand strategy, but he will still defend those moves because he knows better than everybody else, right? You know, like you look at, look at his two withdrawals from Syria in, in December 2018 and October 2019. No advanced discussion, even with his sort of coterie of, of informal advisors, etc., he just gets off the phone with Erdogan and says, "I'm done with that place." Has you he know? learned on the job? The, I, I asked his advisors that they they described instances where he did learn on the job. They said that, for instance, when he did the quote unquote walk from the Hanoi summit with Kim, and I was there, that 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 was an instance where he listened to his advisors who said, "Kim is not giving you anything here. You got to get out. He's not, you know," and, and they cite that as an example. Um, so yes, um, they also say that he's learned at times, I don't know if you want to call them negative lessons, but he's reinforced his own confidence at times too. I'll give an example, uh, the moving of the embassy in Israel, um, that prior to that, he was told by everybody in Intel and elsewhere, you move that embassy, there's going to be months of rage in the Middle East. It's going to blow up terror threats, bombings, you know, hellfire, et cetera, didn't happen. And Susan Gordon uh, tells it as the president came out of there saying, you guys don't know what you're talking about. And he sort of looked at the world coming out of there. He's like, what else can I do that you tell me is wrong? 
and, and I got right. And but similarly with uh, the Taiwan phone call, like with the, the phone call from the Taiwanese president right after his victory, he took that and he said, you just upset the one China policy, it's all over. Oh, and the one China policy survives. And he's like, I know better than you guys. Um, somebody was uh, chiming in saying that we keep referring to the Israel UAE deal as a good thing, which I think uh, isn't kind of probably your view, Jim, or, or mine in the way that I think the, in a sense, I mean, we, we understand it's not a good deal for the Palestinians. Yeah, no. Um, <laughs> but, no. It, I mean, and, you know, Fareed, Fareed's analysis, right, is that, that Netanyahu played Trump on this, right, or Kushner, and that he, he held the prospect of, uh, of annexation over his head, and then, you know, and which he may still be serious about, pulled back. That was his kind of concession there, <laughs> you know, by pulling that back. Um, anyway. Do you see, um, I mean, the UAE, speaking of UAE, has pulled out of Yemen and, and that they've now have done this, this you know, public deal with Israel. Um, you know, can you, I mean, obviously we still have Mohammed bin Salman and the, the relationship with the Trump administration there, which you don't get into too much in the book, but how would you assess kind of just the, the we've talked about Iran a fair amount, but like the relations with the Gulf and yeah. this big bet on MBS and the extent to which that worked or didn't work. Well, it is, it's an instance of the end of human rights being part of US foreign policy, right? It, it's under Trump, it's, and again, regardless of what the official papers say, Trump's own decisions uh, show that it's not a priority or even an, an interest at all of his. I mean, you know, keep referencing the other guy's book, but you know, the, the part about, you know, Trump reveling in Kim's telling of murdering his uncle, you know, is it's just <laughs> remarkable. Um, but th there, there are instances like that across the board. It doesn't, it doesn't factor in. Again, this is, it's just a dirty game. We're all dirty players in a dirty play game. You do what you gotta do. So, you know, it remains to be seen what the US has gotten out of this Saudi partnership. Um, Definitively, I mean, you could say the same about Erdogan. What has the U.S. gotten out of Trump's gifting a buffer zone in Syria to Erdogan? They're still buying the missiles from the Russians, right? They're sticking their thumb in our eye in, in other instances. You know, this, there's a paper tiger element to Trump's toughness and his constant claims that these leaders respect him like no other president in history. I mean, Kim played him in North Korea, right? Uh, yep. Putin is more, not less aggressive. So wh where's the proof of, you know, the, the great realignment of U.S. relationships with these with these folks? Yeah, that that I think is uh, maybe the bottom line of of a lot of this discussion, which is what is the why this, as you put, the Canadians and the Germans and the British at some points and the French. I mean, um, and you know, complain about NATO, which matters. To, publicly described as the most successful alliance in modern history. And then, you know, embrace Russia and really get not much for it and Kim and not get much for it. I mean, what it, that, it, it, it doesn't, uh, you've mentioned this lack of strategy, but there, there really seems to be, it, it's hard to understand what the, what is the end game here with this approach? Yeah, I don't know, political wins in the moment things he could characterize as wins, even when they're not wins, things that enough 40% of the country will agree with and that his friendly for allies on the Hill and, and right-wing media will, will consider victories. You know, I, it's, it seems like there's such an emphasis on, on in the selling of it, right? Um, there is a, an appetite. I mean, I do, uh, I think there is a, a, a disconnect between um, sort of coastal elites and their desire to yeah. engage with the outside world. And so a lot of Americans think, well, we should be less engaged. And of course, the yeah. United States has gone back between isolationism and interventionism, depending on the political circumstances. But so, I mean, just as we wind up here, sort of a final thought, I mean, to what extent, uh, even if we agree that there is not a particularly coherent set of ideas here, necessarily, um, if there, if uh, in 2021 or 2025, depending on if there's a second Trump administration, will his brand of sort of American nationalism 
uh, kind of continue uh, to exist in the Republican Party or elsewhere? Is it is it sort of is there a kind of a Trump doctrine that will outlive him? Well, again, you know, there, to your point, right? And I spent a lot of time on this in the first chapter, talking to Bannon and Navarro. What are the politics behind America First? And they're understandable, right? And Bannon in classic Bannock style, talks about the deplorables. And, and he's like, in his words, the deplorables always get fucked, his words. He said they got <laughs> fucked by the trade agreements. And he said, then they had to send their kids to the wars in the Middle East. And he's like, you know, from their perspective, there's no grand mission there, right? They're tired of it. And I get that. And then, you know, even Navarro, Navarro, when, you know, we're talking about U.S. strategies and so, so on, he's like, ah, the Washington establishment. What have they gotten right? you know, in the last 10 or 20 years? Did they get it right on a rock? No, you know, did they, you know, going back to, you know, you, you could cite the mistake, I mean, you could cite, you could make an argument for things they got right, but you get it, you know, you, you get that that does not come from nowhere, right? And a lot of those are um, understandable critiques and, and that's the politics at the, at the root of this, um, the politics behind America First, we, you know, whether you want to call us coastal elites or just folks who think about the broader implications of this, you know, why is it important to stand up to Russia and to stand up for democratic values and the rule of law and all that kind of stuff? You know, we can make the case for that and believe it. McMaster talks in the book about how much trouble he had explaining to the president the, the benefits of alliances. He's like, yeah, okay, those are the costs, but what about shared values? What about, uh, intelligence sharing on, on terrorism, you know, the, the president just didn't see it. It's very transactional. What did you give me in this moment? Um, and those are the arguments you have to make to the American people, right? You know, it's not, FDR struggled with, you know, explaining the relevance of war in Europe, right? Until Pearl Harbor, you know, it's not entirely new. Um, I mean, I guess that's a thing about populism, right? I mean, there, there's truth, you know, at the root of populism. Um, the thing is then, what do you do with that? You know, you, um, Jim, at the president calling. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Jim, we all want to thank you very much for the presentation. Good luck with uh, the book tour. Thank you. Um, and uh, thanks to all the everybody who uh, participated. Um, Jim, thank you. Thanks to everybody. I appreciate you taking the time and appreciate the questions.